So, Atlas did a thing, and I want to talk about it. I'm going to unpack my initial thoughts on all three announcements, starting with... Persona 5 Tactica. Yep, you know I'm a fan of the underdog, so I've got to give this one the spotlight first. As someone who loves turn-based tactics games and Persona, this is kind of the perfect game for me. It seems Atlas wants to make sure everything but their official attempt at a Shin Megami Tensei Fire Emblem crossover is a better Shin Megami Tensei Fire Emblem crossover. Though from this first trailer, the gameplay looks closer to Mario and Rabbids, and by extension apparently XCOM, than Fire Emblem, and this worries me a bit because I played 30 minutes of Mario and Rabbids and dropped it because I wasn't having fun. Though that was more for the tone and humour than the actual gameplay. So, I'm still going into this with a pretty open mind. This game has an official website already, and it gives some info on a few of the mechanics. Downing enemies still gives a one more, and if you line up three characters in a certain position around an enemy after a one more, you can do a... Tri-Bangle. Yes, that's the official name of the mechanic. It also looks like they've messed with the elements a little bit. Joker's Aha is listed as a despair attack rather than curse. I'll also mention the game looks so much better in Atlas's official upload of the trailer than in the Twitter mirrors. I know the chibi art style may be contentious, but the animations look so fluid and smooth to me. This does not look like a 3DS game. It very much looks like it belongs on modern platforms. I'm mostly excited about this entry for its potential gameplay, but there are a few story things I want to go over. According to this official site, the Phantom Thieves are pulled into this other world shortly before graduation day, which means it's more of a sequel than the Q games which pulled their characters out of the middle of their timeline. Which leads to something I've seen a lot of people raving over, but I'll cover that at the end. Because we also have this new character who we have a name for, again according to the official site. Now one thing I find interesting is her banner. There's a Latin phrase here, and it translates as, If you want peace, conquer yourself. It's actually a mashup of two Latin phrases. The first half comes from a phrase that translates as, if you want peace, you must prepare for war. But the second part is replaced with another Latin quote that refers to conquering yourself, which fits really well with the themes of the Persona franchise. The website doesn't reveal much about this character, just that she's a mysterious stranger the thieves meet in the other world, and she makes a deal with them for mysterious reasons. It's very likely she's keeping secrets from the party, and it's possible she could be an antagonist later, though if she is, I'm sure she'll only be a temporary one. I'd be down for that to happen as a plot point. But finally, the elephant in the room, and to my sadness, one of the few things people are discussing about this game, that and it being yet another spin-off, people are brushing this off just because Akechi and Yoshizawa aren't in it. Look, I admit that it's weird given that this game doesn't have the same excuse Strikers does for not having them. That was developed at the same time as Royal. And after Persona 4 Golden, Marie was in pretty much every later Persona 4 spin-off. So it is a little weird elements for Royal aren't being carried forward into later spin-offs. At the same time though, Two auxiliary Phantom Thieves not being in the game is an absolutely not a deal breaker for me enjoying it. As long as the gameplay is fun, and as long as the story is decent by spin-off standards, I don't mind. I'm gonna give this game a chance regardless. I doubt it will be as popular as the other games Atlas just announced, but as always, I love a good underdog. The official site does list a Repaint Your Heart DLC that includes promised characters, so it's possible they're selling their content separately, which is a little annoying, but at the same time, I'm probably going to be content with just the main storyline. I do not need these two characters to enjoy a Persona 5 game. Strikers showed me that much. And now, the big one. Well, not the big one for me. 
My reaction to Persona 3 Reload is very subdued, only because I always knew it was coming. Even before the leak, I highly suspected this existed. So the announcement felt more like ripping off a band-aid than anything. While I do think Persona 2 deserved a remake more, Persona 3 is one of my favourite JRPGs of all time, and a contender for my favourite game of all time, but one of my biggest issues with it is, I had a hard time recommending it to friends and family, because even Portable has some pretty glaring quality of life issues compared to the more accessible Persona 4 Golden and Persona 5. I was hoping for a remake to change that, and now I've got one. And I'm liking how the game looks from the trailer so far. But already this announcement has been mired in a lot of controversy, and I can definitely see where it's coming from. So, I'm going to address what I think about what I consider the two biggest controversial points. Firstly, the complete recast. Now, most people saw a partial recast coming, but I didn't expect a complete cast replacement, and to be honest, I'm more okay with that than a partial recast. For a few reasons. One, if they had gone for a partial recast, I'm sure they would have reused some of the old audio outright, and that would have felt awkward in conjunction with new lines. Two, I always felt the original Persona 3 dub was inconsistent. Let me explain. Persona 3 came out at a point where English dubs of Japanese games had, in my opinion, only just started getting good. As a result, there were some brilliant performances in there, but there were also some lacking ones, and the contrast between them was very jarring. Let's just say, no offense to their original VAs, I'm sure you're great people, but... <gasps> Look out! <gasps> I'm not sad that Fuka and Ken's voices are being replaced. Another one I took issue with, retroactively, is Yukari. I like Michelle Ruff as a voice actress, but I feel like the harsher tone she was instructed to use for Yukari was a big role in making her so hated in the West. When I played Persona Q2 and heard Yukari's Japanese voice, I was amazed at how much nicer and more friendly she sounded. So I'm hoping her new voice gives that kind of vibe, and maybe people actually stop hating Yukari now. A lot of these new VAs are up-and-comers from games like Street Fighter VI and Fire Emblem Engage, and I've enjoyed these actors in everything I've heard them in so far, so I'm cautiously optimistic about this. It also makes me wonder whether the non-party Social Link characters are gonna get voice acting now, because they've never been voiced before, and that would be really cool to hear. Here's how I see the recast overall. It's like if your favourite long-running play is going on tour internationally with a completely new cast. While the old performances will always live in your heart and might be the definitive version of those characters, you're excited to see this cast's fresh new take on these characters, and whether it makes you view any of the characters differently. It really sells this being more of an adaptation than a complete remake. But speaking of complete remake, here's the issue that I predict to be even more controversial. As I record this, this is already blowing up on Twitter. The fact that this game is going to be remaking the vanilla content with no additional parts of FES or Portable. I can see why people are upset about this. Part of the reason many wanted a Persona 3 remake is that FES and Portable both had things the other didn't, so a combined version of both would be the definitive version of the game. And now we do get a remake, and it's actually neither, making the whole process even more confusing. There's also just general drama over remakes not having the same content as the original, like for example some of the Pokemon remakes. There was a side tangent, I will say, I love the Battle Frontier, and I also love Auras. I think Auras had enough new content to justify not having a Battle Frontier, but uh, that's just me. But new content is the key word here, because something I'd like to point out, FES, or FES, or however you want to pronounce it, 
didn't really add all that much. Apart from the answer, which was really its own game, in fact it was optionally sold separately in Japan, and adding a social link for Igus, which I am almost positive the remake will include, because if it didn't, people would really, really riot given how popular she is as a waifu. The rest of FES was very minor scenes that didn't affect the main plot, and quality of life improvements to the social links and side quests, which I have no doubt will still be done in Reload in some capacity. The fanbase views Persona 3 Fess, like Persona 4 Golden and Persona 5 Royal, as a completely revamped, substantially expanded experience, when really, Fess was a balance patch priced as a full game. I'm not trying to say the people being mad over this are wrong. Quite the opposite, I think they are right to be complaining about a lack of content. A quick note regarding a lack of new content though. Blink and you miss it, but in the Velvet Room you can see a fusion involving Silky. Silky was not in any previous version of Persona 3, which means there are going to be brand new Personas added to the roster this time. Also, since my first recording, sources have confirmed that no fest content more refers to the answer not being there. And the devs have said this doesn't necessarily mean other fest additions will be excluded. I'm assuming this means Igus' social link will still be in, as well as maybe some of the Junpei Chidori events, and Elizabeth's quests. But it won't be affecting my personal opinion on the game. And here's why. I didn't want a Persona 3 remake because I wanted a definitive version. I wanted a Persona 3 remake so I could recommend this brilliant story and experience to my friends and family without having to also recommend they spend the entire playthrough glued to a guide in order to have fun. I love Persona 3, but damn if it isn't a rough game to play blind. Reverse? My rank with Yukari is reversed. My rank, yeah, with Chihiro is reversed. My rank with the Photography Club is reversed. When did all these happen? My rank with the Transfer Student Bebe is reversed. And that's gonna set you back horribly when it comes to the combat, which you're also just learning on a blind playthrough or realizing all the girls now hate you just because you wanted to be friends with more than one of them thanks to a confusing and very punishing jealousy system and the girls' social links being locked into romance. That's one hope that I have for this remake. Please add platonic roots for the girls. And your only other option is to stick with a very rigid and restrictive max social links guide, which I know some people don't like doing on their first playthrough. I just wanted a version of Persona 3 with a more forgiving social system. And I've gone off topic, but while I'm still off topic, I want to bring up something about the social links that has also caused some rage, the confirmation that Kenji still exists, and has not been replaced with Junpei. I get that Kenji is not the most liked character in Persona 3, and he makes a very bad first impression, and a bad impression for a lot of his social link, but I think that's actually part of P3's charm. A lot of the later entries just make their social characters unconditionally likeable. If they do have flaws, they're always very minor and they're gotten over quickly. Persona 3 wasn't afraid to depict some very flawed people. And a cool thing I always thought about Kenji's social link that many people didn't realize because they dropped it early, it's actually a pretty brutal deconstruction of teacher-student romances. Even though the game kinda has its cake and eats it too with the hermit social link. Overall, I'm still okay with this, as long as they don't add Mara as day one DLC or something. Wait a minute, it just hit me that Mara was added in Fess, which means there's actually precedent for them doing that. I hope to Philemon that's not the case. But despite all of that, the most hype Atlas announcement to me was the one that I never saw coming, 
and it makes me wonder whether the leaks were deliberate as a smokescreen to make this even more unexpected and more hype. Project ReFantasy isn't dead. It's now Metaphor ReFantasio. Which is a complicated title, so forgive me if I still call it ReFantasy at times. I see a lot of people worrying about Persona 6 being years away thanks to the other two announcements. Well, to that I say, this is literally just Persona 6. It has archetypes, it has a velvet room, it has social stats, a calendar system. This pretty much just feels like medieval Persona and I'm totally down for that, especially with a lot of the team being involved. I'm not going to do a full-on trailer analysis, but here's a few interesting details I noticed. The date here says Flames Day, which is actually a literal translation of the Japanese for Tuesday, but I always thought their date sounded really cool. It looks like there's a class system, and classes level up. This screenshot shows classes named Trickster and Soul Hacker. And if you look closely, the trickster class icon looks like some hands grabbing a heart. I am wondering whether these classes are going to be tie in day one DLC, because I wouldn't put that past Atlas. But if you compare the faces next to the party members in two different battle screenshots, it might reveal something else about these mechanics. These faces are different for the characters who have different classes, which implies the archetypes or persona stand-ins are your classes. This is a cool idea, essentially combining the fantasy JRPG class mechanics with demons and personas from the Shin Megami Tensei franchise. In this screenshot of a battle, we have a very Persona 5 style UI with many of the same options, except there is a synthesis for teaming up, and more curiously, pass, yielding your turn. And if you look at the top, those are four very press turn looking icons. If this game combines Persona gameplay and party systems with mainline SMT's press turns, it might just be my favorite Atlas battle system of all time. Also, for clicking in the left stick, there's a retry, turn back the clock. I've seen this in turn-based strategy games lately, but never in a turn-based RPG, so I wonder how that will work. Oh, and one of the party members is named Hulkenberg, <laughs> which is a name I cannot say with a straight face. But from everything we've seen, I'm very hyped and excited for this game. Even though it feels very derivative of Persona, it is nice to see them trying something new with the formula. That's all I want to say about the trailer, but there is one other thing I want to talk about that falls more in the realm of speculation, specifically regarding the plot and overall tone and themes of it. There's this modern trend, maybe influenced by Game of Thrones, I've seen in a lot of medieval fantasy lately, Stories that tell the audience, medieval fantasy sucks and you suck for liking it. As if people think enjoying the medieval fantasy genre of fiction somehow makes you a monarchist in real life, which is absolutely not true. Fantasy fiction is not meant to reflect actual Middle Ages history. To paraphrase overly sarcastic productions, some people just want superhero medieval times. Not for escapism, not because they somehow want to go back to feudalism, but because it's fun fiction to read or watch. Where am I going with this? Well, I've seen people speculate that based on some of Atlas's marketing and the lines in the trailer, this story is going to go that route. And to that I say, if it did, I honestly wouldn't mind. Even after everything I said, I'm not totally against dark, deconstructive fantasy stories, as long as they make their protagonists actually likeable and not come across as hypocrites who are just as bad as the villains. As long as they're the kind that is deconstructing something 
from the perspective of really enjoying a genre and knowing how it works, rather than just because an author doesn't like a particular genre and wants to make everyone who likes said genre feel bad. I guess you could call that bad faith deconstruction. I guess the only way I'd have a problem with this is if it went full-blown SMT and the late game forced you to side with a number of factions, all of which are horrible. But overall, I'm cautiously optimistic about the story at this point, and I don't mind what tone it ends up taking, though this could just be because Fire Emblem Engage already gave me my light-hearted medieval superheroes fix. And that's all I wanted to cover. What did you think about these announcements? Let me know in the comments, and I'll see you all in my next video.